We've been working on Ephesians 1. We've done three messages from Ephesians 1, from the Ephesians prayer. You remember what anything was about? Ephesians 1 was to know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. Right? We talked about those things, and tonight we're going to start looking at the Ephesians 3 prayer. Um, I'm going to start off, I'll read the first two verses, and then we'll read it out loud together. Because we didn't put them on it. Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Now we'll read it together. That he would grant you, or grant me, according to to the riches of his glory, Ephesians 3, let's read from the card together, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in my heart through faith, and that I would be rooted and grounded in love, that I may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that I might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I ask or think, according to the power that works in me, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. We read this from the New King James and personalized it. This is what we're working on together. Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, being rooted and grounded in love. First, let's back up a verse 14. Before we start all this, it says, I bow my knees to the Father from whom every family is named. You know, no matter what kind of father you had, good, bad, or indifferent, Present, non-present, alive, dead, whatever. People have had all kinds of experiences. But everybody has a father. If you're in the body of Christ. One father. The father of all. And he's a good father. And he looks out for us. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. What is he talking about? He wants you to be strong on the inside. When he says, when it says inner man, he's talking about your spirit. We know, because we've talked about this before, that we are spirit beings. Why do we know that? Because God said, Genesis 1, in the likeness of God, he made them male and female. He made us just like him. Jesus said, God is a spirit in John. God is a spirit, and he made us in his likeness. If God is a spirit, we're also spirits. We are spirit beings, but we live in a body. We have a mind, a will, and emotions. We have souls. That's our soul. But the soul is not supposed to lead you. Your mind should not lead you. Your emotions should not lead you. Your will. People say, I'm so strong and I'm going to make it happen. Well, we'll see how strong your will is. Is your will based on the right things? Do you have the right information? No, we need to be led by our spirits. The Holy Spirit speaks to our spirit. He doesn't speak to your mind. He doesn't speak to your emotions. He speaks to your spirit. And your spirit tells your head. That's why you ever notice sometimes you're reading the Bible and it seems like, yeah, I understand, I understand, something's going on here. But your mind is still saying, what, what, what? You ever happen to you? Your mind doesn't quite grasp it, but something inside of you says, yeah, that's good, yeah, that's right, that's what I need. That's your spirit. Your spirit's learning and your spirit will digest and it will tell your head about it. That's how it works. We need to be strong in spirit. Proverbs 18, verse 14 in the Amplified Bible says, The strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble. But a weak and a broken spirit, who can raise up or bear? Again, the strong spirit of a man sustains him in bodily pain or trouble. You can go through all kinds of hard times if your spirit's strong. Your mind might be screaming, your emotions might be screaming, I can't do this, your body's saying it's too much for me. But your spirit, if it's strong, you can go right through. That's what will take you through. But if your spirit's weak, you give in too easily. And when the devil attacks and, and throws all kinds of junk at you, 
It's easy to just collapse. We can't afford that. We have to have a strong spirit. One thing we know, you know, Mark eleven twenty three. When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. We read that many times. You have to believe you receive by faith, and faith is of the Spirit. So if you don't have a strong spirit, you won't be able to do it. Your whole life force is in your spirit. If at some point your spirit leaves your body, you are no longer alive. Your body's still there. Maybe they got it hooked up to machines, hearts beating. They say there's something going on, but if your spirit's gone, you are not alive. The spirit is your life force. Um, my husband Vanner told me when he had his stroke, at one point, he definitely died in the ambulance. They were speeding as fast as they could. He's, he said afterwards, when he finally became conscious after weeks, that at one point he saw himself looking down into the ambulance. He was above it, and he was watching them work on him. His spirit had left his body. That's why he, the real man, was looking down at that body. But thank God he got to come back inside. We need a strong spirit to be able to resist attacks of the devil. Temptations and pressures. And when people come against you, what's going to hold you through? In Second Corinthians chapter 2, Paul talked about something. And I like the way Paul expresses things. You know, Paul doesn't pretend. Some Christians like to pretend, but Paul never did. Second Corinthians chapter, actually not chapter 2, chapter 4. Second Corinthians 4. Start at verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. What is he talking about? Paul didn't say everything's wonderful with me. I'm just doing great. Oh, I'm just praising God and just floating through life. Huh? He said, no, having a hard time, guys. Afflicted. Paul, Paul went through so much. He was stoned. He was beaten. He was thrown in jail. He went through a lot to bring the gospel. Paul didn't pretend. He said, yeah, afflicted, persecuted, perplexed. But the thing is, I'm not crushed. I'm not in despair. I'm not destroyed. Why? Because his spirit was strong. Because the spirit was strong. See, we need to understand. It's okay to say, I'm having a hard time. It's just, what do you say after that? But God. Faith is, do not leave it with, I'm having a hard time. Faith is, what God said. Therefore, I believe. He said, he'd get me through this. He said, he'd never leave me or forsake me. He said, he's my healer. He said, he's my provider. He said, he gives me peace. Whatever it is you need. But God. Some Christians think that it, um, we should deny things, and that would be faith. You know, your back is just screaming, I can't take any more out my back. That's what you're thinking. But you say, oh, praise God, I feel wonderful. Is that the truth? No, it's a lie. Why should we lie? Why should we deny it? No, that's not faith. It's not faith. And it's not lack of faith to say, yeah, there's a problem. But what is faith is calling things that be not as though they are. You can say, yeah, I'm in pain. My back hurts, but by Jesus' stripes, I was healed. I believe I receive healing from him. I don't have to pretend that what is is not. I need to say what is not according to the word of God that God promised me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's different. Because some people accuse us of being uh, unrealistic, of not being willing, having our head in the sand. That's not the truth. That's not what we're doing. No, we see what's going on. But we take the word of God and we say, okay, word of God, higher. Word of God's higher. Above all this mess, above whatever we're going through. And Nehemiah chapter 8 was interesting. These people had just uh, come out of captivity. They come out of the Babylonian captivity where they had been for, I think, 70 years. 
They went through a hard time. They were slaves, and they were back in Israel hearing the word of God for the first time. Now, generations had been in Babylon. These people didn't know what God's word said anymore. So they one day they got everybody, from the babies, the kids, the women, the men, everybody, and they had them stand out there. And then the priests stood up, and they took turns reading the law of God. And the people worshipped him. But when they heard the law of God, and then they explained it to him because it was probably old Hebrew or whatever, they made sure they understood exactly what it meant. And when the people heard it, they started crying. Why were they crying? Because they realized, man, if we messed up. And man, is our family messed up. Because if we'd have just done what God said, we wouldn't have been in Babylon. We wouldn't have gone through all that baloney. We wouldn't have been slaves and had a hard time. God promised to take care of us. And what did they do? They worshipped idols and all that mess. So they were standing there crying and grieving. In Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10, this is what Nehemiah told the people. Then he said to them, go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Here's the thing. Yeah, you realize you failed. You realize things have gone wrong, but we don't need to stay there. If we focus only on the things that have gone wrong in our life, we can remain depressed forever. But we need to learn like these people. He was saying, okay, yeah, you messed up down there. Did you repent? Yeah, you did. Oh, we know that's for us. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. I've confessed that he's forgiven me. It's over. It's over. I'm not going to stand and grieve and be depressed and be sad because I messed up. I'm going to take the joy of the Lord again. You know, not every situation in life is solved quickly. We might be praying and have to wait a while. In uh, 1997, I believe, in the spring, God spoke very clearly to my husband and I, that we needed to move to America, we were in Austria. We had built a house. Of course, we had a mortgage over our heads. Only been there six years. New house. Um, he had a good job. He was getting, got promoted. He was probably the, high, the highest level he'd been. And God said, it's time to move. Go to Oklahoma to Rima Bible Training Center. You need to go because I want you to preach. You teach my people faith. But he told Vanna. He told each of us separately, so there was no mistaking it. We knew God had spoken to us. But here's the thing. It took time. I mean, you'd like to just jump up and run out the door that day. We'd have said, well, praise God, let's just go. Pack a suitcase and take. Mm -mm, that's not wasn't possible. The only way we could have lived in America was to sell that house because we couldn't have paid those bills and been gone. We had to sell the house. That's meant we had to get rid of our furniture. We had to get rid of everything we owned. And we had to move our family to another country. Um, easier said than done. So what did we do? First of all, Vanner made sure this was God. You know, if it's a word of God, it'll stand the test. We need to not be so anxious. He came to America. We sold uh, a nice cupboard we had to one of our friends who wanted it and with that money he bought a plane ticket and he came to america for two weeks he went to a camp meeting in oklahoma at rama uh he took time to pray and listen to god and by the time he came back he said yes yeah, this is god we need to go there and it's right and so now we know okay confirmed we're doing this thing now this was scary he had a solid job this was a um a fixed position he could have you know they couldn't fire him easily the job had securities to it. We had insurance. We had, you know, all the stuff that matters to a family man. But he needed to let it go. So he wanted to make sure before he gave up his job and sold the house that he'd struggled to build that it was God. Well, now we knew it was God. We said, okay, God, now what do we do? Shall we just sell it and go? Well, yeah, sell it and go. But how? We prayed every day, prayed, Lord, what do you want us to do? He gave us details one after another. Clean out the attic, paint the walls. Um apply for your visa. Vanner being Austrian could not just come and live in America. He had to get a visa. And thankfully, he got us a green card too. So we could actually work here. But it was a big, long progress process. They don't just let people come in. And for Europeans, they expect them to have a lot of money. On top of it, if we wouldn't have sold the house, they wouldn't let him in the country. 
he was that way for that, for for an Austrian. And so we had the house appraised, and they said it's worth so much money. We said, we're selling it, and this is what it's worth. Okay. Sounds like enough money to us. Got his visa. Great. But the house still wasn't selling. What do you do? Every day we praise God. Every day we thanked him for selling that house, that he's working it out. He told us to do something. He's got to make it work. But we, nobody wanted to buy it. So then he had another impression in prayer. Well, talk to the pastor of the church. A lot of people from the church, it was all people from the church that lived on that street. Just tell the pastor of that church, if you want someone from your church to buy this church, to buy this house, we'll give the church a cut of it. If you can get someone from the church to buy the house, the church gets a cut. So that made them more favorable. So he announced and said, so, you know, Vinner's selling his house, and uh, it will benefit us if one of you buys it. So that made it, that was already opened the doors, more people to think positive, but still nobody was coming. Still praying, God, what do you do? See what I'm talking about? It takes time. Not everything God says happens immediately. I started going out every day, standing at the end of the road where it was quiet and praying, oh God, and asking him for all the things we needed, Lord, to sell the house. We need a car when we go to America. We need a place to stay. I asked him for a place that had a swimming pool because I knew Oklahoma would be hot. Wouldn't you know our first apartment had the swimming pool? God took care of that. Um, for Christian school for the kids because this was right after Columbine. And we did not want to put our kids in public school after that. Um, I've been got, gone for 20 years and that sounded pretty scary to bring my four kids to America and put them in school with that. So we looked for Christian school and found they were a couple in town. All these things we were praying, but there's no way we could afford any of it. Not without selling a house. Praying every day, God, please work this stuff out. God, please work, you know, in Jesus' name, I believe you You do this. And after doing that for a couple months, God said, stop asking me. It's done. Now, I didn't say anything done. But he said, you stop asking me and you start thanking me for those things. Change your prayer. See, I didn't know the principles of faith yet. I had to go learn. So I changed my prayer. Thank you, God, that this house is sold. And thank you that the kids are in Christian school. And thank you. We're accepted at school. And I thank you that we have a car, a good car, a new car. In fact, might as well ask God for a new car. Bernard never had a new car in his life. Only rebuild. We asked him. And not only that, every day we got together and praised God and thanked him that he was working his out. He's selling the house. We're going to America, et cetera. I'm telling this because it took us a year and a half to get here from the time God said go. Eventually, we came. He worked it out, sold the house, did all those things. But as we prayed and believed and had patience, faith plus patience plus perseverance, if you give up halfway, you're not getting it. There are some things God says you don't get overnight. And you don't get them next month and you don't get them next year. Some things are going to take time. You keep holding on. If God said it to you, the main thing is, did God say it? Are you sure God said it? Did he promise you in the word? Okay, then don't let go. First Timothy chapter 4 tells us how to get a strong spirit. Two main things. First Timothy 4. Start at verse 6. And pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Two things he says in there. Feed, constantly nourished on the words of faith, and exercise. If you want to have a strong spirit, you got to eat, you got to exercise. What are we eating? The Word of God. Now, when I say the Word of God, I'm saying the Word of faith, not the Word of unbelief. Not things that people made up like, you never know what God's going to do. Well, if you don't know what God's going to do, open the Bible and read it. 
Because God tells you exactly what he's going to do right here in this book. And if we believe it, we can have it. We need to listen to teaching that's solid, that builds your faith. Don't listen to things that tear you down. Eat with your ears, your spiritual ears. Listen. Listen to good teaching. Chew with your mind. What does that mean? Meditate or think about it. What did I just hear? What did the word of God say? What did that preacher say? Think about it. Chewing. Eat with my ears. Chew with my mind. And swallow. Or accept it as truth. Yeah, this is right. This is God's word. I'm, and it becomes part of you then. You eat the solid faith-based teaching. That's nourishing. And exercise is being a doer of the word. That's James chapter 1 tells us about that. James 1 verse 22 says but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves doers of the word what does it mean to do the word do things in faith don't start something and say well i don't know if god likes this or not but i'm just going to try it wrong find out what god wants and do that Worship God. Praise God. Pray in the Spirit. Believe God for things. We need to be constantly believing God for something. We're believing for something in this church, aren't we? And I'm making a confession, too. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. We're believing for things. And walk in love. Even when it doesn't feel like it. Sometimes when you'd like to just smack somebody. That's your emotions. You just... Be quiet and you back off. Okay, Lord, mm, I bless them in Jesus' name. Mm, I just choose to bless them. I just, yeah, God, would you do something good for that person? God help that person. They obviously need to know you. Well, they obviously need a blessing if they are Christian and they're just not walking in love. Okay, help me to be kind. It takes faith to do that sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. It's an effort. And walking in the Spirit is listening to what the Holy Spirit tells you. You know, as we talked about it before, he wants to not only help us with spiritual things, but practical things, too. I mean, if you're going looking to buy a car, for instance, why don't you say, Lord, I really need guidance in this thing. You know what we need. Years ago, oh, that was the case for us. We were a young couple. We had our firstborn was a year, and we were expecting a second child. And we had a, a Passat which was too small because the baby buggies and those that, and that we had at those times did not collapse very far. They were big, stiff boogers. And we always had Werner's guitar because he was the worship leader. This big, heavy case. So between the guitar and the baby buggy, that was it for the trunk. And now we got to put a second kid in that car. Not happening. So we started saying, God, we really need a van. We really need a van. We can't afford anything new. So could you help us get a good used van? And we started praying and believing God for a van. Just using our faith. You think, well, do you need to pray for that? Yeah, we did. We didn't have money. We didn't have anything. But you know what? God laid it in the heart of Vanner's brother to help us out. He found one, and he helped us buy it. God will deal with other people on your behalf if you trust him. See, God cares about this kind of stuff. He loves you enough that he's looking out for you. But he's just waiting for us to give him a chance. They got, you know, give him a chance to act, not just do it all on yourself. Well, I'll figure this out somehow. Wrong. That's pride. Ask God. Ask God. And one big way we exercise our faith is through confession, which is saying what God says. Not saying whatever you feel like. What does God say? What does the word say? For instance, Romans 8, 37. Here's a good one. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer to him who loved us. What things? Hard times. Right before that, he's talking about hard times. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. What can I say? So if I'm making a good confession, I thank you, Lord, that I'm more than a conqueror through you who loves, who loves me. Thank you, God. You help me to overcome. And not just overcome, but overwhelmingly overcome. That's a good confession. That's not being led by my feelings. Or the circumstances, yeah. Thank you, God. I'm an overcomer. When If we talk negative all the time, you're going to get drained. You ever notice that? Listen to people who are always down. They're going to bring you down with them. Or we could start looking 
listening to words of faith, we could start saying them ourselves. We could find a verse and say, I thank you, God, for this. You said, nothing will separate me from your love. I thank you. You love me today. You're going to help me. That's a good confession. Sometimes we're going along and life gets so overwhelming, you just feel drained out. And you notice you're tired all the time. It's very possible that you're spiritually drained, too. And if that happens, and it does happen sometimes to children of God, don't be condemned over it, but there's something to do about it. Get quiet again. Wait on God. Read the Bible and be still. This is not the time to listen to music. This is not the time to turn on your favorite preacher. If you're empty, go to God first. I'm going to be still, God. I thank you. Tell him whatever's going on. Read the word and then just wait. Give him a chance to answer. Because I bet you God has something to say. He usually does. You may just need to rest. If you want to be restored spiritually, sometimes rest is the key. We overwork sometimes and think our body's made of steel, but it's not. It's made of flesh. All of us. we got to learn sometimes to stop and just be quiet again. Proverbs 17 tells us an important thing about being quiet. It's one more. Proverbs 17, verse 27 says, He who restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's counted prudent. Sometimes the smartest thing you can do is close your lips. Remember when I was really, I was young, I was 18, I was the youngest one in my Bible school when I went to California. And sometimes people said, wow, you're so wise. And I thought, really, actually what I am is quiet. I'm just listening to you guys talk. Um, I'm not going to, if I open my mouth, I'll reveal how immature I am. So let me just listen and, yeah, people think you're smart if you learn to be quiet. And sometimes that's the only answer. Cool. Cool spirit. You don't want to be a hot spirited person. People think that's great. No, it's not. It sounds like uncontrolled. Let's don't be uncontrolled. Let's have our spirits under control, our mouth under control. Two things we asked for in these Ephesians. One in the Ephesians three prayers that concern our spirit. In the Ephesians one prayer, we asked for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Don't we need that? Oh, yeah, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. And today we ask again to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. We need his spirit strengthening us. We need that strong spirit. We need that wisdom and that revelation of God. There are things about God that I'm telling you, you don't know yet. There's things about God I don't know either. But I'll tell you what, I'm ready to learn. If he's got something new, I'll say, yes, Lord, teach me, teach me. Open my eyes to see it and make me strong in spirit. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. And thank you that your desire is to make us strong in spirit. You don't want weak children. You don't want us to remain spiritual babies, always needing a bottle. You want us to grow up in you, to understand the word of your, your precious word, to understand how to live with it, to understand how to walk. God, I pray you'd help us to become strong inside, strong on the inside, strong enough to withstand attacks of the evil one, and strong enough to be there for others who are going through hard times. We thank you, Lord, for your precious word, and we give you all the honor in Jesus' name.